Pastor Stokes said on Wednesday night, he, he, when he spoke, he said, you know, not my voice, but yours, Lord Jesus. Uh, I, I want to be nothing, so you can be everything. I, I must decrease so you can increase in me. So I still remember you, you just summarizing that perfectly, uh, Pastor Stokes. So, you know, that's what I want to happen right now. I, I want all, Miguel and I, wave your hand, Miguel. Uh, we, we went to uh, Illinois Youth Center yesterday. Illinois Youth Center is a prison for young men, uh, 12 to 20. In Jan January, we baptized uh, one young man in the in the Jesus' name. It, it was awesome. The presence of God came in. And the young men watching just couldn't believe it. Um, you know, just seeing the manifestation of, of God's spirit. Yesterday, we, we started to... We started again we to plan to to give uh, God, God's word to these young men. You know, as long as God has an open door, we, we are going to go. I had two young men uh, ask about baptism. You know, they're they're not ready, but you know we're gonna we're gonna get them ready, right, brother? That's right. We're gonna get them ready. Get them ready. And so the word has spread. And God has not done at IYC, and you know, in this uh, we've been obedient to go. Um, uh, the burdens there and, and God has an open door um, the word obedience and submit have a different meaning to those that are followers of Jesus Christ I know when I'm in submission to God's word everything works it just you know even in the bad times it works because I'm you know, side by side with my, my Lord and my Savior, you know, when everything's a mess, I, I, I'm standing almost above it with my God saying, what's the direction? Where do you want me to go? This, this is our God. I, I know when I'm in submission to God, you know, First John chapter 2 says, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. When I was in the world, I thought I was in control, but my decisions were corrupted by priorities and values that just were not of God. When you heard the word of God and you actually do it, you bring blessing to your life and to those around you. Romans 20 through 23 says, uh, chapter 20, um, uh, chapter 6, actually, um, 20 through 23 says, when, when you were slaves, and, and I'm going to paraphrase this, it's a longer scripture, when you were slaves to sin, you only reaped shame and emptiness. But now set free from sin, you become a slave to God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. What, what I'm saying here is that, you know, when I say submit and, and obedient in, in, in the world today, that's the last thing you want to do, Right? It's it's almost it's almost a, a, a bad word. You, I'm not going to be obedient to anyone. I'm not going to submit to anything. But here, you're you're already a slave to sin. Now you can be a slave to God. And to be a slave to God, there's 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 you know a huge benefit. Number one, eternal life. But we know self-rule is iniquity, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. But what if you submit? you'll actually be free. This, this is what the word of God says. John 8, 31 through 32. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. When you carry the truth, you know, that corruption of the world, it, it can't affect you. The reason we need to abide in his word because he told us to, right? He's God. This is enough because we're not smart enough. We don't have the wisdom. Our righteousness is but rags. The world is not for us, but God is for us. Yes. The benefits are eternal, but there's more. He equips us. There's other benefits. It, the word of God refreshes our soul, gives us wisdom, gives joy to the heart, gives light unto our eyes. We can always count on the Lord's word to be pure and endure forever. And be righteous. You, you know what the world gives you. You know sometimes it's pretty useful, but it, it, there's always a taint to it. There's always a corruption that'll lead you away from God. God's word is pure. It also gives warning. 
The benefits assist us in doing the work he has for us. So trust the Lord and give him your obedience. God bless you. Praise God. It's great to see all of you. And we're having fun in the house of God. We're so glad baby could be with us today. <laughs> He's looking at me. <laughs> he looks up like, he, that's my name. And we're so glad you're here. And welcome to the house of God. If you're a visitor here today, we're so glad you're here. We believe that God has something absolutely incredible for you. Doesn't mean we get it, though. You'll find out why in just a minute. But I believe some people are going to get it. Yeah. Didn't your parents ever look at you and say, you're going to get it? <laughs> That's not what I mean. <laughs> Would you mind standing with me just for a moment as we go to Isaiah chapter 28? The Bible says that, that God will only chastise those that he loves. But what does it mean when God just loves us? You know, I'm not going to chastisement today. In case you think I am, I'm not. Um, he loves us. He wants to make something available to us today if we'll open our hearts. Isaiah 28, 11. The Bible says, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to, his, to this people, to this people. They were corrupt. If you look at the scriptures before and after, I'm thinking, how did that scripture arrive in such a corrupt place? I mean, it, before and after, it's just a mess. And he said, staring lips in t another tongue, will he speak to this people? Wow. Thank God, because I was corrupt, and now God has brought me out. And it says, verse 12, to whom he said, this is the rest. Everyone say rest. This is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. The Bible says, when you look at the first where it says rest, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. At 5.30 this morning, as I was praying, God said, look that up. I'm like, yes, sir. I looked it up. Never before have I looked up the two words rest. It said, this is the rest wherewith you cause the weary to rest. I assumed that it was the same. And it's not. The first word, when it says, this is the rest, menuha is the Hebrew word, which means resting place. We have a tendency to look at the word rest and simply think that it's just laying on the pew and taking a snooze. I'm just going to relax. It's not. It means resting place, which means to whom he said, this is the rest. The stammering lips in another tongue. This is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. The second word is nuach, which is a totally different word, which means to rest. So God said, he said, I am going to provide my spirit. It's going to cause you to speak in other tongues. And he said, it will be a resting place. I'm looking for a resting place to put my spirit so that you can rest. See the difference? You have to be, you have to be, and I have to be the manuha. We have to be the manuha so he can find that resting place to give us rest. I want to preach on God's resting place today. Lord, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, the greatest name that ever will and never has been given. We know there is one God and that his name is Jesus. And all demons tremble when they hear that. Lord, I feel just saying that, I feel your incredible authority in the house of God. And I submit to that name. I submit to the knowledge of who you are. And I pray that you would take dominion and power. God, over every fear, over every adversity, over every resistance to you, Lord, and that you would accomplish your will today. Would you release every person, Lord, from any resistance, from any disease, from any fear, God. Re God, release them, I pray, that they might truly experience the freedom that is only given from heaven above. We pray in the name of Jesus. Could you say in Jesus' name?
Could you say it again with authority? I like that. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Would you just say, I want to be God's resting place? Yeah, that's what I want, God. I want to be your resting place. In Acts chapter 1, and in verse 4, Jesus looked at the disciples and he said, I want you to go to Jerusalem. He said, being together with them, commanded them. Now, this, I know it says that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but they weren't there yet. What he was saying is, once you get there, don't leave. Because we find out in the next few scriptures, he, they actually then go to Jerusalem. So they weren't there yet. So they go up there. He said, I want you to go to Jerusalem so that you can wait for the promise. Everyone say promise. promise. I want you to go there and wait for the promise, which you've heard of me. I've told you about it already, but you don't have it yet. So you, you heard about it, you know about it, but you don't have it. And then in verse 12, the Bible says, then went they up to Jerusalem. So they obeyed him. Everyone say obedience. obedience. God said, I want you to go get a promise. Well, how about if I just wait here? No, I want you to go to Jerusalem so that you can receive the Holy Ghost. You can receive the promise there. Okay. So Jesus takes off. He ascends, disappears. And they said, you know what? I have a good idea today. Let's go to Jerusalem. Let's do what God asked us to do. So they turn around and they travel over to Jerusalem. And then in verse 14, if you'll put that up, thank you. Aren't they doing a good job upstairs? I appreciate that so much. <clears throat> sound and audio and thank you so much for all that you do all the behind the scenes stuff uh, makes it possible thank you for all the online people god bless you may you be a resting place too forget about that once in a while you gotta you gotta see them through that little 14 these all continued all the people that went up to jerusalem now when they went there how many were there anybody remember how many were in the upper room about 120. About. They went there. Now notice he had a couple of disciples that watched him go. And then he said, go to Jerusalem. Well, there wasn't just 12 in the upper room. There was 120. Why? Because they were like, guess what? We're going to get the promise. You want to go? You want to go? Would you come with me? You want to come with me? Come on, let's go. Let's go in the upper room. Let's go get the promise. Remember the promise that he talked about in Joel 2.28? Saying, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. That's the one. Why don't you come with me? By the time they got to Jerusalem, there was 120 people that were up in the upper room about. And they went there. And it says this. They all continued. Or they were all with one accord. They were there for one reason. They went there and they were in one mind, in one accord. They said, we are here for the promise. And it says they were in one accord in prayer and supplication. So they were praying. Praying allows us to communicate with God, but it also causes us to be humble before God. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways and seek my face. Then will I hear from heaven. So he said, will you pray? It's a humbling thing to pray. But it also said in supplication. Supplication is saying, God, we want your spirit. God, we want you to fill us. God, we want you to fulfill your prophecy in me. God, I want you to use me in your kingdom. God, it's that, it's that supplication. So it's not just, oh, God, help me. It's, Lord, I want to be involved. I want to be a part of your promise. I want, to be, I want you to be my priority. So they all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. So what were they doing? They went into the upper room and God gave them a promise. God gave me a promise. Good. Did you go get it? Did you go get it? Well, God gave me a promise. Yeah, but did you go get it? Yeah, but God is everywhere, Miguel. God is everywhere. So he's where I am. So if he wants to give me a promise, just right here is good. Go to Jerusalem. Why? Because he said so. Go to Jerusalem. Why? So that I can get a promise. So he goes, it, it, what were they doing in that upper room? I'll tell you what they were doing. Their obedience, their prayer, and their worship was literally creating, creating a resting place. 
God said, go there and be unified and pray. And when they were doing that, what they were doing is they were creating a resting place. God was saying, I want to pour out my spirit. God gives promises every day. His word is absolutely jam-packed, full of promises. Why don't they happen today, yesterday, day before, day before, day before? Day. Why, did, why are things so hesitant to actually come to us? Because it's like, it's like a tree that's full of fruit and nobody can get to it. You know what faith and prayer is? It's one of those apple pickers. It's one of those long poles. We have one. We have one in the church. I can change that bulb from right here. You just put it up there, you push it on, and you turn it, and you come. I can't reach it from here. But if I've got an apple picker, I can, you can pull it and pull it right down. And then you can put the new one up, and you can put it. What, what is faith? What is obedience? It's an apple picker. It says, I can't reach it normally, but something's going to happen in me. What? So that I can prepare a resting place for the glory of God. And once I do that, it's like something that brings that precious apple right down to us. And it says, you can have this. See, it's already hanging there. It's ready to come. But we need to prepare a place for him. That's what they were doing in one accord, in prayer and supplication. The upper room was simply... A place preparing for Pentecost. Just looking for a vessel. How do I know? Because not everybody there received it. 120 were in the upper room approximately. And the Bible says 3,000 received it that day. But there were people that were standing in the streets. And they said this. What's going on? Well, they obviously didn't receive it. Because they looked and they said, Are these people drunk? These people are drunk. They, didn't eat, they had no clue what was going on. So they weren't receiving what was coming down. Why? Because they didn't make a resting place for it. They didn't say, Lord, I will prepare a place for you to descend upon. I will open my heart. There are, there are people that, 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 that walk throughout their day. There are people that sit in this congregation right now. The glory of God is going to fill this temple. And you have a decision to make. Will I create a resting place for him right now? Or will I just keep the umbrella up and say, not today, not today. No, yeah, no, you're, you're close enough, Lord. You just hang in right there and I'll just hang right here. You can stop it from happening by not preparing a resting place. Bible says, as I quoted in Joel 2.28, Bible says, and I will pour out my spirit. In the last days, saith the Lord, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. So if he poured it out upon all flesh, but not everybody has it, that means we can choose whether we're going to receive it or not. How do you do that? Become a resting place. We, that's what happened to me when, when I finally received the Holy Ghost. I simply said, all right, okay, God, I don't know how to do this. I don't even know what's going to happen. But the Bible talks something about tongues. So guess what? I'm just going to... I'm going to create a resting place. I'm going to welcome you. I'm going to make you welcome in my heart. I'm going to give you permission to come close to me by opening my heart, by apologizing. See, you know, our tables can be so full with junk. And we say, God, I want, I'm going to give you a resting place. And he's like, I'm not sitting there. It's like, why? Why, God? I've been sitting there for a long time. He said, no, get rid of that junk. Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, please forgive me. Lord, I'm sorry. I don't ever want to do that again. God, I want to be better. I want you to make me better. I want you to get rid of all. There we go. Okay. Now you can rest there, Lord. Now you can come. See, because light hath no fellowship with darkness. He's light. Darkness is our sin and our attitudes and all. And he said, I will come, but I want you to clear a place. What did John say? John said, hey, make your path straight. Make your path straight so the Lord of glory can come. Yeah, but why doesn't he just come? Because he wants a straight path. He wants to get to you. He wants you to clear the path so that he can come. And he will do that for us. No, notice, we have, we have in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 3, then he said, go borrow the vessels. There was a woman that was about to lose her children. And he said, I have an idea. You're about to lose your children because of debt. Here's what you're going to do. Go borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Everyone say empty. empty. 
Go get some empty vessels. I need things. I don't need something that's empty. I need something that's full. I need like a wallet that's full. Amen. Go get empty vessels. Okay? Doesn't make any sense to me, but I'll go get some empty vessels. She goes and gets the empty vessels, or the kids do. Borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shall pour out. Everyone say, pour out. Pour out. Wow. I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. There's the same word again. That pour out is a word that was used for casting like uh, a silver and gold and, 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 and lead, etc. You, it's like you make a cast for it and you, 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 you take something, you put it in there, you press it, you put all the dirt around it, you press it down, you, you take it in half, pull the thing up, put it back together and you pour in. That's what this pouring in is talking about. It's, like, it's saying, I want to to make something of you. I want to pour something in you that will stay what it is. I want to pour it into you. And so it says, go do that and pour into all those vessels and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her, upon her sons and brought the vessels to her and she poured out. So she took this vessel of oil that she had and they spread out all these empty vessels. <clears throat> Wait a minute. They were partially full. No, they were dirty inside. No, they were empty. The Bible says they were empty. Go get empty vessels. One of our mistakes is that we go out. God says, I want to pour into you. And we go, that's awesome. That's awesome. What do you want me to do? Get an empty vessel. We come back and we say, there. Here's a vessel. Here, God, fill me up. He said, I said, empty. Yeah, but there's room. God, go ahead. Put, put in there. Fill it up, God. And he said, empty. I want an empty vessel. We try to take the promises that hang over us and we try to receive them into a resting place. And God says, not empty yet. Not empty yet. God will not mix what he has with what we want him to. God, can't you just take what I am and just kind of put a little cover on it? Just take your glory and put a little, top, just top it off, God. And he's like, no, I want to fill you. See, if I had a partial cast or a cast that had, had, had crumbled down and it, and it wasn't off, if I poured it, I would take, I would take the, 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 the medallion or whatever I was bringing out and it would, it would be partially done. God says, no, it has to be completely empty because when I pour my, what, I'm in, what I'm pouring into it, once we open up the cast, it will be a whole vessel. He said, I want you to be whole. I don't want you to be partial. I don't want you to be tainted. I don't want, to, I don't want it to be coated with, with dirt and oil and grease and slime. I want, I want it to be pure. So, so let's start over. Let's, let's, let's wipe it all out. There were times when I'd have to take that casting and open it up and take that, that black dirt and, and just get rid of it. Just kind of pound it down, get it, and then start all over again. And God will do that. He wants to start with an empty vessel. Empty vessel. And then it says, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, there is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed or stopped. You see, God's oil will pour into us if we have a resting place for it. If we say, Lord, here, empty. God, God, I'll empty. There we go. Okay, God, here's a resting place for you. It's completely yours. Just fill it. And God says, great, I'll pour it out. The oil will flow into it until it's full. And then he said, got any more? Nope. Okay, done. When we offer him a resting place, when we offer him a place where he can fill, he will fill it. That's what he's saying through this. If you'll come to me and, and say, you know how you get your vessel empty? Sorry, God. I don't like who I am. Lord, I said some things. I did some things that you don't like. This says it. God, I, 
I violated some stuff in here. So my heart's not empty. In fact, it's full of garbage, Lord, and I pray, God, would you let mercy touch me one more time? We could all say that today. This talks about perfection. I'm not perfect yet, but I'm working at it. Every day I'm working at it. Fasting and praying and saying, reading that word and saying, God, you read it and you go, ooh, I want to skip that page. I don't like that page. All right, God, that's it. I want that in my life. I want, I want you to help me with this scripture right here. See, that's what, that's, how, that's what it does. Take stuff off of our table. When we pray and we repent, we say, God, I'm so sorry. It clears the table. Why? So that we can have more of him. John said, I must decrease so that he can increase. We can't have both. You can't have, see, John represented the flesh. Jesus represented the spirit. John said the flesh has to get out of the way so the spirit can come. We say we want more of God, yet we hang on to John. We got to say, Lord, let that go. Let it go. Let me, let me release the flesh. John was powerful in the flesh, but Lord, I want more power in the spirit. Help me to do that, Lord. And, and you know, we are temples that are prepared to house the new birth of the spirit. That's what we are. We are supposed to be that resting place. God is saying, know ye not that you are the temple? You are the place that I want to dwell. You are the place that I want to rest in. I am looking to create a resting place. It used to be in places made of stone and, and wood. and all, But I want to dwell in temples not made with hands. I want you to be my resting place. Why? So you could have rest. You can't have rest without a resting place. Look at uh, one, of, one of the reasons why is Lot lived in a corrupt city called Sodom. And God sent angels to him and said, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a little bit of time. You run and tell every one of your family members to get out of this city because I'm going to destroy it with fire. Fire and brimstone. Man, nobody will follow me. That's another message for another day. But the point is, is God said, come on, Lot, let's go. And ended up grabbing him by the hand and pulling him out of that city. And he said, now nobody look back. You understand? And well, that seems kind of picky. Why are you picking on me, God? Nobody look back. Imagine the explosions they heard behind them. The screams that they heard behind them. Don't look back. And, and, and his wife stopped and looked back and she became a pillar of salt. What am I talking about? God, I am going to prepare a resting place for you because I want more of you. But I'm a little concerned about what I might lose. I'm a little concerned about what I'm used to. I'm a little concerned about some addictions or habits or Previous beliefs or traditions or religions or what somebody told me that might not be true. So how about if I just give me half full. I'm going to hang on to all the stuff I'm comfortable with. And you just give me my future. Did you ever try? No, only God can do this. Did you ever try to like be in one city and stay where you are now? Wouldn't that be awesome? You could stay in bed and go to Chicago at the same time. So you can get rest and get some things done. That's what we try to do. I know it sounds stupid. It sounds foolish. But we, we want to be who we were and yet be something else. You can't get to Chicago and stay in Bartlett. You can't get there. You got to leave Bartlett to get there. You can't. You can't be filled with him and be who you were at the same time. God is saying, you can't leave Sodom or stay in Sodom and receive your future. You have to get out of Sodom to receive your future. But what is my future? That's called faith. What do you have for me, God? Well, 
for starters, let, let's start with salvation. <clears throat> if you stay where you are, you're going to burn. Get out of there. Okay, good idea. That's a good start. You're going to save my life today. Okay, that, that's worth it. That's a good start. You know, I mean, think about it. He saves him out of there. I mean, if God snatched you from a... Imagine that. You turn and look, and the whole city goes... It's just, a, it's just a mushroom cloud. And you just walked out of there like minutes ago. Boom! You're like... God, what would you like me to do? You know, what's next? You know, do you want me to do a couple of somersaults? Whatever it is, I'll do it. Because that worked. God, okay. But just don't look back. Boom. God, I'll, I'll believe you. One of the problems with the hesitation, with this, one of the hesitations is, I'm just afraid that what I'm leaving is better than what I'm getting. What I'm letting go of is more important to me than what he wants to give me. If I go like this and I say, Miguel, I want you to give me $20. How am I going to do that? With your left hand, I know that. This is a point. How do, how do you... Okay. It's not easy. Come on, buddy, lay it on me. See, you can receive way more. I can't receive as much with this in my hand, but if I let go of it, I can receive so much more. What we need to understand is God is saying, I want you to let go of what you are, what you have, so that you can receive what is hanging over this congregation right now. God is saying, I want to overshadow you with something extremely powerful. Now notice, God has a plan that he is releasing on us. Today. Everyone say today. today. God wants to do something right now. God said now is the day. But he's simply looking for a resting place. It can fall. And it will fall. It did this morning. Oh my goodness. It was, it was like trying to swim in molasses. It was so thick. God is going to do the same thing for us in just a couple minutes. Nothing is birthed without pain. And all the mothers say amen. The Bible says that, that the pains of travail in childbirth are excruciating. But it says once the child arrives, it's just moments after. And the Bible actually says it's amazing how the shift is. The shift goes from the pain of the birth process to the joy of the promise that's received. We look at, we look at the childbirth ourself. You must be born again. We look at, God, you want to birth something in me. But our, our, our focus immediately goes to the pain. God, I don't know if I want the pain of what you're going to extract. I don't know if I want to go through the pain of surgery. I mean, think, think of how ridiculous I am. February 2018, they cut my shoulder apart. I work hard. I work hard for nine months. Finally, it's like, ah, 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 ah. okay, it's now December. Let's do the other one. That's not normal. You guys aren't praying hard enough for me. That's not but you know what I looked at? I didn't look at the pain. Devon, I didn't look at the pain. I looked at the reward. I said, I couldn't do this nine months ago, but I can right now because I went through the pain, the pain of surgery. But then my other one, as I'm going through passing the mantle with this arm all, and then it's like, well, I can do it. And then I trip and people go, and then I, I get it out of the sling. And I'm like, okay. Look. So now I got two that are working. Why? And I would do it 
again because of the reward of being able to do it. We need to look at what God is promising us right now and say, Lord, whatever the pain, I'm willing to do it for the reward. Who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross and despised the shame. He looked at the pain of the cross and he looked at you and he said, you're worth it. You're worth it. I'll go through it because I get you. Yeah. I want to be a resting place for what he's promising, don't you? God, what are you trying to give me? What are you trying to do in me right now? I feel, let's close our eyes for a minute. Let's lift our hands to him. Just lift our hands to him with our eyes closed. I don't want anybody looking around. I want to be able to focus on him just for a moment. Lord, what are you talking to me about right now? If I keep preaching loud and fast and strong, we'll go right past it. But I don't want to do that. In the name of Jesus, take a moment, Lord. You're talking to some people about something right now. It's worth the pain. It's worth going through it for the reward. Lord, what is it that you're trying to do to me, for me, through me, right now? Jesus. Oh, it's happening just like it did this morning. It's beginning to settle. It's still, it's still pretty diluted, but it's about to intensify. Peter, watch this. Peter went to the temple. Peter went to the temple. And he said this. He saw a lame man. You know how many times they lay him, it says, and laid him daily. That means every day. He was there every day. Every day they went to the temple. He was there. One day, he looked, Peter looks at him. He's like, the guy's looking at me like he's going to receive something. And Peter said, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have. You have something, Peter? Yes, I do. I'm going to give it away. Such as I have, give I thee. Now watch. What Jesus gave him was sufficient to heal somebody that had never walked all his life. He simply said, Lord, I'm going to become a resting place so that you can give to me. You can pour into me. And what comes into me, watch, what he received was enough to raise a disabled man from the ground. He literally grabbed him by the hand, such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And it says, he rose up and it says he leaped and he walked and he went into the temple leaping and praising God. Look at my legs. They work, they work, they, hey, they work. My legs work. You see, when God gives us, that's what God wants to do here. God is saying, I want to give you something. But you got to be like Peter. Lord, I open my heart. Lord, I want to be a resting place for you. Why? So that I can be glorified? No, that I can give it away. That I can pray prison kids through to the Holy Ghost. That we can baptize people. See, he wants to give to us so that we can simply give to others. Let me go a little further before I close. God help us right now. Luke chapter 1. Verse 38. God came to Mary. Prophecies had been given in Isaiah multiple times. Behold, a virgin shall be with the child. And shall call his name Emmanuel. And then in, it says it again. Unto us a son is born. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And his name shall be called Wonderful. And he comes to Mary who is a Jew. And, and he said. He said. Hi. Mary. Um, I'd like to use you. God use me. It's not what you think. I'd like to just borrow your womb for nine months. Okay? And then what? Well, the Messiah is going to be born through your womb. But that can't happen, God, because I'm still a virgin. 
With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. But notice Mary's comment. Mary said, okay, watch. Mary said, that's interesting. But behold, the handmaiden of the Lord. And she said, be it unto me. Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. When the Spirit of God overshadows you, we can easily sit there and go, ooh-wee. You come into a church like this and you go, man, the goosebump machine. Somebody turn the AC on 20. Somebody open up the doors. Get the shivers and I feel it overshadowing. But then God says, may I use you for a minute? Could you be a little bit more specific? Yes, I'd like to. I'd like to have you stand before all of your people in shame because of illegitimacy. Not so sure, God. I want to use you and it's not going to look good. And then we look and say, Lord, be it unto me. Because the overshadowing can come over all of us as it is right now. We can feel it. But it will stay there. She could have said no. But she said, okay, be it unto me according to thy word. Now, God is overshadowing us today. But Mary was willing to bear the cost of the miraculous. The miraculous came with a cost. The shame. God, I'm engaged. God, I have a fiancé. What in the world is he going to say? Why don't you wait till after we're married, God, and then then it won't look so bad. All these things, tell me these things didn't go through her head. Uh, 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 okay. Yes. Yes, God, I'll go ahead and do it. It cost Mary something. Imagine, it cost Joseph something. Every time he walked around and she's like this and they're like, didn't you just get married last week? illegitimacy. So it was an investment on her part. And the Bible says in Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where your investment is. She invested not money. She invested her dignity. She said, I am willing to give my dignity to God. Why? Because I don't need it where God is involved. In the world, you need credibility. In the world, you need dignity. But in God, all you need is faith. She said, Lord, I'm going to trust you with my future. I'm not going to worry about letting go of my past, which is pure. I'm willing to let go of legitimacy and turn my back on Sodom and walk toward you because I trust my future with you. I trust whatever you're going to do in my life because, because you're awesome. You got me this far, God. You can get me even further. I'm closing. The Bible calls the Holy Ghost the promise. Mary, Mary is great with promise. Anybody ever get a promise from God? Oh yeah. And it's not yet been born. Mary is carrying her promise. She's carrying her promise. Mary is directed by God to go to Elizabeth. Goes to Elizabeth. Mary's carrying a promise. Elizabeth is pregnant with John six months in advance. Bible says 
Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Ghost. She's absolutely, the Bible, when it says filled, it means to be influenced completely under its control. She's doused in the Holy Ghost. The baby jumps inside her, all from somebody carrying a promise. She didn't have the promise. She simply came into contact with it. She got close to a promise. That's what some people feel. They come close to a promise and they go, woohoo! And then they leave without the promise. But Mary had the promise. And she's carrying the promise. If, if getting close to you with a promise affects you like that, how much more would it affect you if you receive the promise? Can you feel that? Let's lift our hands to him again. Lord, God, your promise is here and it seriously is hanging over this congregation. Again. There are some people that are satisfied with feeling the promise. But Lord, somebody in this place is saying, no, 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 no. <laughs> because when Mary left, so did the glory. Mary took the promise away until she had the promise. We don't want the promise to leave. We want to take the promise home with us today. Notice this. The promise is born. His name is Jesus. Jesus goes walking through a crowd. Making his way through the crowd with the disciples. And somebody who desperately needed him. A dying woman. Guess what? We're all dying. A dying woman pressed her way through the crowd. I want to get through the crowd. Why? To touch him. See, she didn't touch the promise. All she did was get close to it. <laughs> A woman sick with a disease that was killing her for 12 years. And all she did, all she did was grab the hem of his garment. Just got close to the promise. And when she got close to the promise, <laughs> virtue flowed through her body and she knew immediately she was healed. That's what happens. When you get close to a promise, what's our problem? You don't even need the promise to be healed. All you got to do is get close to the promise. All you got to do is touch the hem of his garment and faith itself. What would happen if we create a resting place for the promise? Oh, God. Know you not that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost? Serious? You mean I'm not going to Bartlett UPC to visit a promise? No. You're going to take one home. God, I'm going to create a resting place. We get so used to experiencing the promise. We get so used to standing next to people. She's loaded with the Holy Ghost. And I'm like, whoa. It's warm around here. And then I walk out the front doors and go. Then we get close to somebody else. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's because we get close to a promise. God wants us to take it home that will change our life forever. You see, we need to make sure that we open our heart and say, God, well, I need my heart to be a resting place. Would you stand with me today? Isaiah 9, verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Isaiah, what are you doing? Well, God told me to tell you this. Yeah, but Isaiah, 
That's not going to happen for 700 years. I know, but God can't wait to tell you. He's so excited about what's going to happen. He's going to tell you 700 years before it happens. Can you see that? Winston, have you ever like, this is what I did with my mom. I received a small, a small settlement for a motorcycle accident I was in when I was 21. I couldn't wait because my family was so poor. I couldn't wait to buy my mom a microwave. Back then, that microwave cost $250. They had microwaves when I was 20. <laughs> you guys, but they were, like, they were like this big and they weighed like 18,000 pounds. You know, they were just massive. But $250 back then, now you get them for $69 at Costco, you know. You're welcome, Costco. <laughs> but I couldn't, I bought it for her and it was just big. All, the, all my brothers and sisters had these little presents for her. And I had this big present and I'm like, I got my mom a microwave. I'm like, oh, just open it now, would you? Just open the thing. And she opens it up and goes, there, that's God. That's God looking at us saying, I got a present for you. And I just want to tell you about it. But it's not coming for 700 years. I know, but it's so awesome. I just can't wait. I can't wait to share with you the promise. And he gives us this promise. And he said, it's just ready for you to receive. If you're willing. If you're willing. How many prophecies and promises are simply waiting for a resting place? God wants to use you. He wants to give you. He wants to heal you. He wants to deliver you. He wants to touch your mind, your heart, your soul. And he's saying, will you, will you make a decision? He already poured it out upon all flesh, but it only lands. It only lands on the resting place. Would you close your eyes with me for a moment, Lord? There's renewal that wants to come. There's forgiveness. There's people that want to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. There are people that have promises that you gave them Maybe a week, maybe a month, maybe a year, maybe 10 years ago. You gave them a promise. But I believe you have just given this congregation a key. Because you stand at the door and knock. The glory is setting on the congregation right now. And the key is in your hand. If you will worship with faith, you will open up and you'll say, Lord, right there. Rest right here. But God, I'm, I'm, I don't deserve. Stop. We never will. But God, I don't believe it. Stop. The word of God says, these signs shall follow them that believe. They shall speak with new tongues. The Bible says that. It doesn't happen anymore. Stop. Miracles don't happen anymore. God. Lord. Resting place. Because for man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. So today, Lord, I come through my worship. These altars are open right now. If you come up here, now it's time to put your mask on. You can pray in your pew. You can pray standing at your pew, or you can come up here. If you come up here, somebody will definitely pray with you. If you stand in your pew with your mask on, somebody might pray with you. We'll probably pray with you. But our goal today is not to jump up and down and say, I murdered 45 people. Our job today is simply to say, Lord, you have something for me right now. And I can feel it. I'm not walking out of here with a feeling. I'm walking out of here with a promise fulfilled.
right now. You can have a promise fulfilled in your heart today if you come up to this altar. The miraculous is waiting for you if you'll come. Hmm. Let's begin to worship. Would you trust God right now and come and pray? In the presence of God.